<clears throat> for this uh, learning opportunity and interactive quiz and um, something to get your your guts really rumbling when you're out and hiking, hopefully over the summer months and um, this spring. So um, I'm sure you, if you've jumped on these before, don't be afraid to pop some questions in the chat area. Um, I'll do my best to answer them, but I will add to my introduction that Mary so kindly shared that um, I am by no means a wild foraging expert. It's just something I really like to do kind of in my free time. Um, and I think it's a great way to connect to the land in a historical way and a, and, um, a cultural way as well. Um, so we're, I mentioned earlier as I was planning this that I feel like I could talk about this for hours. Um, but I'm not going to take that much time. I'm going to be really cognizant of, of what we're at. So um, we're going to get get started here. <clears throat> I'm curious about how many of you folks um, do any foraging. If you want to kind of give a wave and show like, yeah, I've collected and popped stuff in my mouth as I was hiking. Okay. Lots of people, good. Then you have what I call um, brave taste buds. I usually present on this topic when uh, I teach summer camp okay, with fifth and sixth graders. No, and um, you your willingness to try some things out there and do some research is, is something that I commend. So there are tons of wild foods out there. You just have to know what you're looking for. And that's pretty important from a couple different perspectives. Some species might be protected. Um, some areas you're collecting might be sanctuaries or protected zones. And um, there are lots of lookalikes out there. So you're gonna wanna be 100% sure, not 99%, 100% sure of what you're collecting and about to pop in your mouth um, to keep yourself and anyone you, you share your foods with safe. So I just want to share a couple basic ethics. If you're taking notes, we, uh, whether physical or mental, um, maybe you're planning to help for a hike this weekend, the weather looks beautiful. Here are just a couple things to kind of keep in mind. Um, it can be really exciting to find free food in the wild, like whether it's in your yard or whether it's in a you know local park or something like that. Um, so, and sometimes that excitement brings this this feeling like you need to collect it all. The first thing I can say is don't be greedy. Most foragers um, ask to to follow the rule of thirds, meaning um, don't collect more than a third of any plant that's available. It could be a third of like the root base. You know, if you're collecting like the tuber or something underground, it could well, be sure. a third of the flower buds. If you are like collecting buds, but you you don't want to over harvest because you don't want to push that species to no longer thriving in that area. They still need to undergo their life cycle for the season so that there is more next year. So kind of keeping in mind that sustainable harvest method. Um, yeah, the next thing is know what you're collecting. As I mentioned before, there's lots of ways you can build up your knowledge base on uh, knowing what you're collecting. Uh, if you already see yourself as a naturalist or a budding naturalist, your awareness is really important as you're out looking at plants. Some details really might come down to the shape of the leaf, the size of the plant, or the season that the the edible food is available. So um, using books, learning from others, and sometimes learning from others means learning from previous generations that have just been harvesting food from the land for, for years. As you collect, try to be gentle. When you're gathering, do as little damage as possible to the plants that are surrounding what you want and the area that you're gathering from. Um, try not to just like rip the plants out completely, take what you want and then leave the root base out to dry out, obviously. Um, the less of an impact you can leave on the landscape, the better. Be a good neighbor, meaning in addition to being like a polite guest, obviously 
to your neighbors if you're like collecting in your neighborhood you want to ask permission before foraging on a lot of different lands so um many of you have been out to river edge before we are a nature sanctuary so a safe place for plants animals and people river edge is not an approved food collection site um however we are really lucky in the state of wisconsin and southeastern wisconsin to have plenty of natural areas around and you might even have friends who have land um, lots of the plants i'm going to highlight today are things that you could find in your backyard or taking a walk around the block in the city. So I've tried to add a little bit of a mix so that your perspective isn't just wild foods are only found in traditionally wild places. Of course, you wanna follow that ethic of, you know, leave the space better than you found it as well. Um, consider, consider the location that you're harvesting you want to you want to think about it, if you're really visible where you're collecting know that you might have other visitors or people from the public that are curious about your habits they don't often see people foraging it's not something that's highly visible so you may have people stopping and asking like what are you doing what are you collecting maybe giving you some weird looks. So kind of think about, about that and your safety as well. Know where you're going. I have certainly been out hunting for morels and, you know, been narrowed down at looking at the ground. And before I know it, I'm in a totally different spot than I thought I was. So keep your awareness about you and consider your location. And then lastly, you always want to rinse your foods you want to think about how you're going to store them and consider how you're going to use them before you even pluck them from the from the ground. Um, again, it can be really exciting to find wild plants, and before you know it, you have more than you can use, and then you're you're not being a great steward of the resources, or you may end up not being a great steward of the resources. Okay, a couple other tips before we jump in. Early season when you're out harvesting, and this can be as early as late April, early May, sometimes even sooner than that in Wisconsin if we have a warm spring, sometimes late, late March even, um, early season foods are going to tend to be a little bit more tender and you can eat them raw. Later in the season, those plants are building up their resistance to other biological threats and natural predators in the system, so they're gonna get a little bit more tough it doesn't mean that they aren't packed with nutrients. It doesn't mean you can't eat them. It just usually means you're gonna to wanna to cook them or prepare them in a different way rather than just popping in the mouth as you're hiking along. Um, start off simple. So that might be, you know, you really know four plants really well and you start to get your, your palate accustomed to, the, to those plants. And you can slowly build onto, onto the plants that that you added to your kind of taste bud menu. Um, learn the different parts of a plant. Um, I am a self-professed plant nerd. My last presentation was on gardening and um, I would have would love to like work with vegetables and plants all the time if I could. So it is really important. I know it's not fun to look at the basic like biology of a plant uh, or the anatomy of a plant, if you will, but you're going to want to know what's the difference between the flower, the fruit, the seed, what's a stem, what's considered a tuber, because some parts of plants are edible, while others will give you adverse reactions, and you're going to want to avoid them. And then the last tip I have is try to keep a foraging journal, even if it's a place where, you know, hey, I only do morels, or I only go for wild leeks, Try to write down maybe the first date that you saw them. Using a little bit of phenology as you are looking for wild foods can help you describe to others if you care to share your hobby, but also remind you for the next season, you know, when did I see that first emerging? Did it taste good at the time that I collected it? Maybe you look for recommendations to go earlier or later in the season based on what you're searching for. So, with that, we're gonna jump into our first wild edible. Whoops. This guy is already in my garden, even though I feel like I've had lots of time to, to pull this guy out. 
Um, this is purslane. It looks a lot like a succulent. It's got really thick, tender leaves. It grows low to the ground. Um, it's been grown for food and for medicine for over 4,000 years. Um, I've seen this plant in bags and available at farmer's markets in recent years because it is so packed with nutrients. Um, it's high in the omega-3 fatty acids, which normally you only find in like flaxseed fish, things like that. So to find it in a plant is really unique. Lots of um, vitamin A and C, calcium, magnesium, lots of those macronutrients that this plant is gonna pull from the soil, from the earth and make available for, for you to eat. Like I said, you heard me mention, it's already in my garden and lots of people just tend to pull and let it talk, like toss it to the side. You can incorporate this into salads. Right now, it's still really tender. It's got like that full succulent look. You will start to see some yellow flowers on it. So just to help with a little bit of identification. Um, flowers and leaves kind of have a slightly tart or sour taste. Some folks describe it as salty. Um, the, the flavor is usually influenced by plant physiology. What's interesting with purslane is it will taste different based on the time of day that you harvest it, which is pretty unique. Um, it, it, again, it's based on physiology. We could get really like plant nerdy here, but at night, it's going to allow the stomata to open and transpiration. So it's not gonna be as tart if you collect it at night, a little bit more salty. In the morning or midday when it's really hot, it's going to be a little bit more tart. More malic acid is gonna be in there. Um, Purslane grows everywhere. And by that, I mean, you can find it worldwide. It's been incorporated raw into salads. You can put it into soups and stews. It gets really thick, so it can be used as a natural thickener. Um, it, so it kind of gets kind of mucusy when you cook it. That's a really gross word to describe that. But the seeds are also edible. Purslane is very versatile. Um, and I bet if you went out later today, you could find some and try it. Next, wood sorrel. I love this one. This is a, a Cassie favorite. Um, it's got these palmate leaves. They almost look clover-like. But unlike purslane, these leaves are very thin. Um, they have yellow flowers. Sometimes you see them as white. Um, the leaflets actually fold up at night. So if you're out in the evening or early, early morning, they're going to be all kind of folded in on each other, which is real cute. Um, they're usually green, but you can see kind of towards the right hand side of this picture that they almost get like a purplish burgundy look or they can be purplish burgundy too. The cool thing about wood sorrel is when it moves on to the seed phase, they have exploding seed pods. So when something brushes against them when they're to seed, they will actually catapult their seeds out and they are naturally prolific, which is really nice. Um, if you end up kind of, this plant is hard to collect delicately. Its root system is pretty shallow. If you end up pulling the whole plant, Again, very, very prolific. Lots of people would classify this as, as a weed, if you will. Um, all parts of this guy are edible. So if you end up pulling the roots and you wanna rinse it off, throw it in a salad, it's got that really fresh pop, that kind of lemony flavor, high in vitamin C and oxalic acid, the same acid that we find in more traditional foods like spinach. Um, Funny thing about wood sorrel is historically, because it's so high in vitamin C, it's been used medicinally to treat scurvy. You know, we don't see a lot of scurvy much anymore, fortunately, um, but also help, you know, treat fevers and mouth sores and um, help with sore throats and things like that. Now, you may be familiar with other sorrels. They're actually in a different family than the wild wood sorrel. We've got sheep sorrel, which can also be found wild, but again, different plant family. And then we have common sorrel, which we actually grow in our garden. Um, I'm not sure how many of you, 
um, have had sorrel before, but it has a really lemony taste that's different from lemon balm. And we started in our household, and this is an adult audience, so I don't feel shy sharing this. In our household, we started growing sorrel specifically to mix into like vodka gimlet. It's great. Um, this book, I'm gonna do my first book plug called The Drunken Botanist. If you haven't heard of it, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it basically focuses on the amazing drinks, you know, adult or not adult versions that you can make with plants from your yard, from your garden, from the wild. And um, the common sorrel has been, has been one of those. So while the wild sorrel is in the oxalis family, same family as like um, a, a clover, if you will, these sorrels are in the rumex family. Okay, moving on to puffballs. These are so cool. Whether you eat them or just spot them, um, they are huge. They can be soccer ball size. They do, you know, they can be found in smaller varieties. The, the really important thing to note about puffball mushrooms is they should be pure white on the interior if you intend to harvest them to eat. Um, you want to turn it over when you find it and inspect it. Things you want to look for, again, pure white flesh, and you want to look for any boring holes. Insects are going to, you know, forest decomposers are naturally going to go after this source um, of food as protein. So you want to inspect that, kind of cut out anything where you see boreholes, and you should basically remove any additional insect protein or grub protein that might be in that mushroom. If you're looking to eat one of these guys, the key thing with these puffball mushrooms um, that I really wanna drive home here is storage. Because it's a source of protein, if you leave it out on the counter, it's going to start to smell and it's not gonna smell good. <laughs> so the size of these guys are shareable, I like to say. You've got to make sure you've got space in your refrigerator or a really cool root cellar if you intend to eat this um, raw or, or kind of fresh or store it for a little while. These puffball mushrooms are excellent on the grill. They're a substitute for, for um, tofu in a lot of dishes. They can be ground up into hummus. So if you're looking, you got a lot of fresh veggies from your garden this year and you want to make your own hummus, use puffball hummus if you'd like. They can be roasted, sauteed, frozen. You can throw them in the dehydrator. Very, very versatile mushroom. Um, the possibilities really are endless if, if, you can, if you're a mushroom person. If you're not a mushroom person, we'd have to skip over this one. I do want to point out that puffballs there are a couple different varieties. You do not want to mistake a puffball mushroom for one of these. This is just one variety that's toxic and the Amanita species. Um, this one's called a pigskin puffball. You will know it right away from the dark flesh. If the flesh of a puffball mushroom is yellowish, greenish, kind of like a light color, that usually means that the puffball is past its prime. So not poisonous, but probably not something you want to collect to harvest. Let it go to its spore phase to create more. But if you see dark flesh like this, this is just, nope, we're, we're not gonna eat this guy. We're gonna leave it to do its job in the forest. Okay, our next one is lamb's quarters. Again, this one is an edge or what some people might call a ditch species. Um, it's really important with any edge or ditch species like lamb quarter, lamb's quarters or dandelion to consider where you're foraging. You, you could easily find these in a city park, um, just like you could dandelions. However, if that municipality or if that park program sprays, you're, you're not going to want to consume these plants. So you're really going to want to know that location you know, you know your backyard and how you, you manage it. If you see something like, like this pop up and you are a fertilizer or pesticide free zone, go ahead and, you know, collect away. 
This one has a really high propensity for growing in newly cultivated land. So if you've got any areas where there's new construction or um, recently moved soil, this, this plant is attracted to really, I'm sorry, nitrogen rich soils. So um, that's kind of some tips on where to find it. You can see that it's got kind of this whitish powdery, it almost looks like a mildew covering. Um, you're gonna wanna rinse that off. That powdery coat is a biological defense. Um, it can sometimes cause irritation in the throat. So give it a good rinse before you throw it into a salad. Um, Ed, who's on the call this morning, was saying he made himself a smoothie. And I asked if he threw any wild edibles in it, you know, in the theme. Um, lamb's quarters is great to grind into smoothies or juices. It is, you know, it can be cooked like almost any other wild edible by sauteing it. Um, you often find it in soups. When you collect this, it can be stored a little bit longer than something like a puffball mushroom. You can wrap it in a damp paper towel, put it in a Ziploc bag or a container in your fridge, but you don't wanna hold it fresh like that for more than a couple of days. You can throw this in a dehydrator as well, or you can blanch and freeze it and then add it to um, your soups, your sauces and things like that. Okay. Here we've got our wild daylily, and this is one that I recently learned about. I've got this stuff growing in my yard, and to be totally honest, I have looked at it as kind of a nuisance for the last couple of years, and I recently learned that it's edible, whereas some of my more formal teachings have, have I've heard that anything in the lily family is toxic. That's true for like traditional lilies, however, this daylily, and the reason why I threw the Latin name up there, Latin names are really important when it comes to collecting wild foods because there can be so many similar common names. This one is edible. Big difference is the way that this guy grows. You've got those really long kind of spiky leaves. The flowers are um, on a stalk rather than on on a um, more world stem, if you will. This is considered by many Asian cultures the tastiest lily. Um, it's used a lot in like a sweet and sour soup. The shoots, the flower buds, the flower petals, and the tubers underground are all edible. So there's a variety of ways that you can prepare this plant based on when you harvest. So if you've got daylilies, this is one of those wild foods that can really be sustaining from the perspective of it's available starting in the spring with early shoots all the way through the fall when you can pull tubers. And those tubers are just like fingerling potatoes. So, you know, whenever I hear about a new wild edible, when in doubt of how to cook it, it's always like fry it with butter and salt. You can eat, it's gonna be delicious that way, right? Um, and that, that goes for, for these as well. You can put them in a salad for kind of like an interesting texture, a pop of color. They Some people say they taste a little bit like a scallion. Um, I've recently tried my first one. I don't personally taste scallion. It's more to me like a fresh, crunchy, just green taste. Um, so if you're looking for more of a oniony, garlicky flavor, Go with a plant that we all love to hate, garlic mustard, <laughs> um, or a cherished spring edible like the wild leeks or wild ramps. I just wanted to show really quickly the unopened buds and just how, how neat and delicate they look. They, they can be sauteed and added into a stir fry, but you can see here how simple it would be just to snip those buds give them a quick rinse and um, pop them into whatever dish you're preparing. Okay, next we have wild violets. And this one can be a little tricky because we all know Wisconsin state flower is the wood violet. Um, that one is edible, but 
depending on where you collect, it's highly discouraged to obviously harvest your state symbols. Um, so these wild violets are not the same as the African violets that you see people um, putting in their homes or their office spaces. Both the leaves and the blossoms are edible. Um, you can do raw or cooked with them. This plant is extremely high in vitamin C. Um, these flowers are great to make into like a wild vi violet syrup. Again, something that you might make a simple syrup out of and throw in a drink, or just a simple sy a syrup that you might put on top of yogurt with granola. Um, I've also seen wild violet jam or jelly. I should say it's not really thick and chunky, so it's more of a jelly. The flowers can be whitish to purple. You've probably seen that variety as well. Same thing, same type, type of plant. But because this is so low, low growing to the ground, this is another one that I would just stick in the back of your brain of, has it been sprayed? Is it in an area where they've used pesticide fertilizers? Okay, autumn olive. I don't know how many of you know um, Phyllis McKenzie. She has been part of the River Edge team for many, many years. I learned about Autumn, uh, autumn Olive from Phyllis um, and how this can be a very prolific species also. And a lot of times plants that are prolific are great for harvesting because you can get a lot, even with that one third rule in mind. Um, it's a large deciduous shrub, so we're getting a little bigger here. It's often a volunteer, meaning it will just pop up. So it likes those disturbed areas. You'll really know it from a lot of the other shrubs that you see um, from that bluish green leaf tint. Again, kind of has that white, almost looks like it's covered in a mildew from far away, but as you get closer, you notice that's just its color. Um, berries can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a taste that some describe as slightly like astringent. So just be careful, this is probably not one that you're gonna do handfuls and handfuls of like wild blueberries or something. Um, the thing with autumn olive is that the fruit has to be fully ripe before you can enjoy it raw. If you eat wild foods, just like really any food, I say if you eat lots of it when it's not so ripe, you may experience some stomach upset. Um, you know, I've sometimes jumped the gun on bananas. Uh, I tend to like my bananas a little more green. If I have them a little too, a little too green, my stomach lets me know a little bit, you know, shortly after eating that. So awareness is a big part of foraging and feeding off of wild foods. Notice how you feel, notice what that plant looks like and, and that type of thing as well. Next we have nettle. I have never collected nettle to use because I really react to the stinging uh, effects of stinging nettle. So it's herbaceous. I can tell you several places that this grows at River Edge. <laughs> Again, very prolific, likes more wet climates or I'm sorry, wet growing zones. Um, the plant is covered in little stinging hairs. So that's thus where it gets its name. Nettle has gained a lot of popularity, I would say in the last five to 10 years, based on some, some research that's been done where making nettle teas really helps, or may help, I should say. I don't wanna promote any um, major health platforms. I'm certainly not a, a physician by any sorts, but it's been linked to helping reduce inflammation. It can help folks who suffer from hay fever. It can help reduce blood pressure. Um, and it's more common now to see these dried leaves already at a co-op or in a tea bag form of a, of a nettle tea. But that, that doesn't mean you can't collect this guy and dehydrate it and do it yourself. The key with this is obviously if you brush against it and those stinging hairs give you a reaction, which happens to almost everybody that I know, um, you're not going to want to eat it raw. You're going to have that same reaction then through your throat and down through. So make sure this guy gets boiled or cooked or some way before, before you consume. 
Okay, chicory. Uh, I learned about chicory back in high school and I used to hate this plant before I figured out you could eat it. Um, it's really hard to pull. It's a very tough, tough, um, very tough, thick stem. So it's not easy to snap off. I might it, recommend if you're gonna harvest the flowers here, um, you see them a lot on roadsides, to bring a little scissors or a clippers or something like that so that you don't end up yanking the whole plant out of the ground. The flowers are really tender. Again, great to add into a salad. The young leaves, so when, before this plant really starts to get a foot, two feet tall, young leaves are slightly bitter. So the recommendation is to kind of cook those down and drain them. Drain off some of that bitterness that will go away as you boil and, and you soak. And then you can heat them back up, serve it with butter salt as kind of a wild green or um, with collard greens or something like that. Chicory has become a little bit more popular recently because it's a coffee alternative. So the, the, the coffee doesn't really taste like our traditional coffee bean coffee, but it has a similar flavor and it's described a little bit more woody and a little bit more nutty than our traditional coffee. Um, but it does give that, that boost in energy. So if anybody here has ever made dandelion root coffee, uh, or dandelion root tea. It's very similar process. Chicory and dandelions are um, closely related. So you can dig that plant up, you can cut off the leaves, peel the roots, slice them into thin strips, maybe kind of like you would for a radish, and then throw them in your oven and roast them at a low temperature. So 200, 250 um, for a long time. So like four or five hours, you wanna roast nice and slow. And then you can take those roots and grind them up. I recommend a mortar and a pestle rather than your traditional coffee bean grinder, um, just because when you intermix the two, I like to have a, you know, I recommend having a coffee grinder to grind things that aren't coffee <laughs> and a coffee grinder for coffee beans. I'm a little bit of a purist in that way. So just because some residues come out of those wild plants that you might not want to transfer back and forth. Um, but you can add about one teaspoon of the ground up root of chicory to a cup of water, boil it for three to four minutes, and that's how you get that, that boost of energy or that chicory coffee. Okay, service berry is another great one, um, also known as June berry. This grows in many places in southeastern Wisconsin a great ornamental species that has been put in a lot of um, native landscapes, a lot of yards as a, as a nice um, privacy shield. Great for attracting wildlife, but some um, wild foragers claim this to be like the best berry, the best wild berry that you can find. Um, just one shrub can yield gallons, gallons of berries. So, they can be plucked and eaten right from the tree. As the fruit ripens, you can see kind of in the bottom left corner, it goes from green to red, and then red to deep purple. That's when you wanna harvest these guys, when they're that dark red to almost a deep purple. They're, that's when they're gonna be the best in flavor. These are very sweet berries, they're very juicy, um, and they're quite soft. So if they're not soft and they're not juicy, they're probably not ready. Um, they do contain a lot of seeds. The seeds are safe to consume, but some people, you know, obviously might not like that texture. <laughs> I would say if you're a texture sensitive person, harvesting wild foods might be really tricky for you. Um, but the seeds are kind of said to have kind of an almond-like flavor to them. Uh, service berry is really often used in jams. It can be added to pies with other tart fruits. This one's really sweet, so you don't often see just a plain service berry pie. Um, I've also heard this as being very popular for dehydrating and mixing into a trail mix or just popping them as a snack food like a craisin. Okay, 
I've got two more of these to go. We're gonna move on to the quiz then. So we'll chuck your brains and see if you'd survive um, harvesting your own wild foods. Um, fiddleheads, these are one of my favorites. They're so stinking cute and they are delicious. Uh, if you are a fan of spring asparagus, fiddleheads might be for your palate. Um, this is specifically for an ostrich fern. If you know ferns in wild places, they tend to grow like crazy. The, the fiddleheads, I will say, are really important for you to remember that one third rule though. Ferns can be prolific, but also a little bit sensitive. So try to collect no more than two or three of these um, furled, curled leaves or um, stems. You wanna make sure that that plant can again, make it through their life cycle. So it's a renewable resource for you to harvest again next year. If you eat these guys raw, I've heard that there can be some stomach upset. Um, there can be some kind of scratchiness in your throat. So it's recommended through several sources to boil them for about eight to 10 minutes before you eat them. You can kind of blanch them and then freeze them and save them. So if you know of a really good you know, fern patch, go ahead and go bonanza with the third, you know, one third rule in mind, freeze them and save them for later in the season. Um, and then I personally like these mixed in with like scrambled eggs in the morning. The taste is similar to asparagus or a green bean. So somewhere kind of in between that flavor mark. Um, again, if you do eat them, when they're unfurled, so as they're open, they can be considered toxic at that point. So this one is important for you to watch. You wanna look for that curl. When it starts to uncurl, you've, you've missed your window. So this one is, is a very particular harvest season. Sometimes it only lasts two, maybe three weeks to, to get it while the getting is good. Okay, and my last one here is clover, and this one always reminds me of being a kid, you know, playing outside all spring, all summer, into the fall. Um, there's white clover and there's red clover. There's a bunch of other clovers too, sweet clovers all over the place. Um, you can see the red clover and the white clover have very similar flower shapes. The white clover is gonna grow a little bit shorter, typically in a lawn. Again, watch where you harvest if there's pesticides. These white clovers will continue to produce flowers throughout the season. Those flowers can be collected and thrown in salads. I, again, they can be boiled down and made into a syrup. Um, every part of these plants are edible. So leaves, stems, um, skip the roots on this guy. So not every part. When you start to see the flowers go to kind of a brownish, they're beyond their prime, but they have a very slightly sweet, some would maybe describe it as kind of a vanilla flavor to it. Um, I have heard that people will dehydrate these and grind them up and add them into baked goods, um, clover scones. So the nice thing about this food source is they're really high in calcium, magnesium, iron, vitamin C, um, good for that bone building in your in your body. Um, so uh, another versatile free plant for you. Okay, at this point, I want to point out a foraging calendar for you. And then we're going to move into a segment that I'm calling eat it or leave it. If you're curious about when to forage plants, or what to forage at certain times of year, this is a calendar that is cited in um, one of my favorite foragers, and one of my strongest inspirations, um, Samuel Thayer, or Sam Thayer. He has come out with three or four books. This is just one of them, Nature's Garden, that um, we carry at the River Edge store. I've, we've, had, we've been lucky at River Edge to have Sam come and present um, to some of our audiences in the last two years. And I've seen him at a couple different conferences and taken workshops with him. But he's got this calendar in each one of his books um, of, you know, what are you looking to eat at certain times of year? And this is just a really simple guide of, okay, it's summer, 
I've got time to go harvest, what should I be looking for? Fruits and annual greens. All right, maybe before we get into our eat it or leave it, do we have any questions that I can help address right now? Maybe we take a little, little break. So Cassie, there are some questions in the chat and um, we'll kind of look through and see um, some of them already have been answered. Um, let's see. So when's a good time to start looking for puff balls? Hmm. I would say late summer. They are not a spring I mushroom. Agree. Yeah. Late yeah, I kind of agree that when summer. I remember seeing them. Yep. Okay. So what about milkweed? Um, uh, they are edible. So what part and um, would you consider doing that? Um, that's a that, that's a great question. And that that is going to be one of our eat it or leave it. But I will spoil it now and just answer it in that um, milkweed is one of those where I would not choose that as one of my first wild foods to go for, meaning it's tricky because that um, latex like milk that comes right from the plant is toxic. Um, you, the parts of milkweed that I have heard are edible, the only parts are the seed pods, right? Um, and those seed pods should be collected very early on when they are quite young, still green, and not even cracked open. So w when their seed um, wings are, are still like damp and not dried out, and those pods need to be cooked. They've got to be sauteed. Um, otherwise, you're not going to want to mess with milkweed in your mouth. I, I have actually um, tried milkweed flowers, and that's when they are small flowers, and um, they are quite good. They taste a little like broccoli, um, but again, you're taking away the flowering part of the plant, the part that um, is the nectaring part of the plant, the thing that might attract the monarchs to the plant. So there are negatives to that. So again, that that rule of thirds, maybe just one um, to try it would be enough, and then yeah. um, leave the rest for the for the monarchs. You know, that's so, that's a great yeah. point, Mary. And I'll just say, like, as you go to the next question, um, that's another thing about location. If you're really excited to collect fiddleheads or milkweed, for example, and there's only one or two plants in your area, it's, you know, you want to consider the ethic of that too. What kind of impact are you leaving there? If you, even if you collect just a third of those two plants, is that a resource that's going to bounce back? Or do you wait until there's maybe five, six, seven of them in that area and then go on the one third rule? So. So true. Make sure there's plenty of it before you start harvesting anything. So another question had to do with lamb's quarters. Um, do some of the varieties have rounded leaves? So what I've heard from lamb's quarters is that there's also, it can be mistaken for something called goosefoot, or it's interchangeably called goosefoot. And the short answer to that is yes. And my, my big plug at the end here will be, you want, always have a book always have a guide, have something that you can look at. And it's important to start simple because, you know, plants are just like everything else. They're just trying to make their way to survive. And sometimes disease or fungus or growing conditions will cause that plant to present differently. It may look different than what you see in the book. So you really want to just kind of be careful. But yes, I've heard that lamb's quarters can get that rounded look rather than kind of that, um, frilled look. Okay, so how about um, wild daylilies? Um, most of us know that they aren't invasive. I guess um, while you're removing them, you may want to eat part of them. That might be a fun way to, you know, to use them as you're removing them. That's actually so, one of the recommendations that I read is that if you're pulling them out or one of the recommendations I read was saying like, if you're splitting them to share with neighbors, <laughs> um, which I already told you that I'm not a huge fan of them, but um, if you are splitting them, take those tubers and you can 
you can't cook them up that way. Well, sounds like fun and, uh, and good to eat too. So yeah. what about um, keeping the, um, the birds and squirrels and so on out of your service berries? You know, if you want to eat them, how do you keep these other critters from eating them? Boom, plant a second service berry. <laughs> I, that, that would be my recommendation and just that the service berry is one of those like powerhouse plants. It's great. It's great for wildlife, obviously, based on, on that comment and what we know. Um, you can, if you care to, kind of get netting, similar netting that somebody who has maybe a cherry tree uh, in their yard to kind of keep them out. That, that can be an ever an ever growing battle. I've, I've also heard if, if you can handle this or if your neighbors can, the, putting kind of those, um, I don't know, disturbances or deterrence, like some party decorations hanging from your service berry, you know, when you know that they're getting right up to that point where they're going to be at their prime, you know, throw a party in the shrub and put those <laughs> kind of a, like aluminum looking things in there to keep the critters out if you can. <laughs> Good suggestions. How fun. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we should all go over to Sharon's house because she's uh, thinning out her fiddlehead ferns and uh, she? she might be willing to share some of them with us. But, but if not, um, do you know of other good sources perhaps? So we know River Edge has a good population of ostrich ferns, but other than on River Edge property, where do you think you might find some? I think it's a little past the fiddlehead stage right now, isn't it? Yeah, we're probably past the window is my guess. Um, in, in most regions, Southeast Wisconsin. If you are going far north, um, or if you are going on a trip to Alaska or something, you might find some that are ready to eat still. But um, again, ferns like that are gonna grow in shady, wet zones in general. So you can think of that in a landscape perspective. I have a neighbor who has so many ferns, he has no lawn anymore. Which is, you know, I bet if I went and knocked on the door and said, can I collect, he might look at me like I have a third eye because I live in the city, but then he'd probably say, like, sure, right? Um, so you want to look for kind of habitat and then gain permission. So I would start by, by looking at habitat and then check local regulations. You know, most of our state parks in Wisconsin are going to be no harvest, no pick zones. Um, the nice thing the to know, which is kind of tricky. We do have a uh, national forest in the state of Wisconsin. It is a hall, but national forests were founded on having a slightly different mission and service model than our parks in that they're, they're more about um, the greatest amount of good for the longest amount of time. So they are proponents for collecting in the forest, sustainable use. So that's why in a forest you will see some extremes like timber harvest, but you will also see the allowance of people collecting wild foods, um, fishing, hunting, and that type of thing in those protected areas. Good information, good advice. So is that true also of our state forests, not just the national forests? Ah, I, you've stumped me. I don't know. I would, I would not be afraid to ask. I would, I, and I would say, I, I would encourage anybody to ask rather than, well, you know, you live your life the way you want, but I will encourage you to ask. Some people would rather do the, well, I, you know, I can handle the slap on the hand and then I know. Um, I'm the type of person that would just feel awful if somebody came up to me and said like, you know, all that you're collecting, you can't, you can't do that. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that if you're going to collect it, the plan is that you're going to use it. If you're Good just point. collecting it because you can, I don't have words for that, I guess. Yeah. Why waste the resource? <laughs> yeah, so try not to be, yeah. So again, try to be a good steward of that. So, so um, we have a question about, is a wild day lily the same thing as a tiger lily? You know, that's the tricky thing with common names. And I hate to like push the complicatedness of um, our Latin names or our scientific names, but you're 
we want to look at the scientific name for for things. The way that I know a tiger lily, it 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 looks a little bit more like an Asiatic lily, where it's got the 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 stem and then the leaves are all whirled around it and it comes up. Um, our day lilies are going to be the ones on that long single stem, and they literally only last a day. So when you collect them, you use them that day. They will not. They will not keep. So. They're not those lilies that will open and close for several days um, and have provide you know great blooms for pollinators. They're open for a day and then they close and kind of shrivel up. Such a shame. They're so pretty. It's too yeah. bad they don't last longer. Yeah. So um, there was just a little bit here about um, collecting morels in the Kilmaine State Forest. So. Um, not sure. It sounds like you, you really do, should check it out before you get in trouble. You wouldn't want to end up with a huge fine for being out there on a fun day collecting a few morels or whatever. So better to find out before you, you um, end up with a fine. Or in some cases, you know, it's just like fishing. They can confiscate your, you know, fishing rod or your boat or whatever. So yeah. better to know in advance. And we have somebody that's put up information. Looks like, thank you, Jim. He put up... Um, a website for us to look at if you're interested on foraging. So very helpful link, thank you. Yeah. So I think we are just about done with the questions in the chat. So maybe we should go to your quiz. Okay, so I hope everyone's quiz brain is on. Here is my first question. Eat it or leave it? I put a couple tips there. Feel free to unmute yourself or throw it in the chat. I'm gonna do some, um, poking around on my page to see if I can see the chat. So I make no promises. Mary, you might have to continue to be our- Sure, I'll watch. Our voice here. I say leave it. Jim says leave it. Okay. I said leave it. John says leave it. Does anybody know what this plant is? A poinsettia? I think it's decorative. I think I've seen it in my neighborhood. Mary's on to the right thing. John, you're, it's not a is point study. Is it a castor bean? Okay. It's castor bean. Good Karen, enough. you win a whole bag of castor beans. <laughs> <laughs> is that where castor oil comes from? It is, it is the source of castor oil, which is crazy, right? Um, this is castor bean. This plant is, I, it's gorgeous. It, it's got a beautiful color, amazing texture. And this is coming from like my master gardener brain, right? Um, but you wanna be really careful where you put it. It's not usually found in the wild in Wisconsin. Um, in more tropical regions, you, you might find it. But just one castor bean has enough ricin in it to kill an adult within minutes. Whoa. Okay, these, these you know, so if you have dogs or kids or pets or anything that tend to be plant eaters or this is not a plant that you're going to want to incorporate into your landscape. Um, the other thing that kind of creeps me out about it is I feel like the seeds look a little bit like ticks when they're like really engorged. So um, if that helps kind of remind you like, okay, I'm gonna stay away from this guy. Um, just think like creepy tick ticks. <laughs> <laughs> So gross, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're right. They do look a little like an engorged chick. Yeah, they do. Uh, how about this one? Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Just leave it. Just leave it. Okay. Downsize. They're good. I can't, I'm not going to be poisoning anybody in this group. So that's, <laughs> that's so far. Um, this, does anybody know who this is? Solomon. Oh, well, doll. Nick's name, I think, is Doll Dies. Right. Yep. Um, Again, kind of a creepy, look, I always try to tie like something to help me remember what a plant, a plant is. Um, and doll's eye is one of like the names it goes by. This is also called white bane berry. Um, found in woodland, it's a woodland species. It's in the same family as like poppies, ranunc ranunculaceae. Um, this, um, this can be found at River Edge. And I love pointing this out to kids because they, or anybody really, because they really see that bright white berry with the black dot to look like a little eyeball, right? Um, anytime you see a white berry 
I will say the only exception I know of is like white mulberry. White berries usually mean like stay away from me, do not eat me. You know, think about poison ivy has white berries. Um, there's a couple species of dogwood, I think, that have white berries. So this one here, the berries contain carcinogenic toxins. We all know about carcinogens. Um, they have an immediate effect of making you like really sleepy. Um, they can also cause major issues for cardiac muscles. So um, this one's just stay away from it. Some people, I, I guess, it, I've heard historically that cult, some cultures, some people have taken this berry um, to experience like hallucinogens. But again, the things that go along with that, like severe drooling and stomach cramps and dizziness and diarrhea and cardiac arrest or death are not worth the harvest of this plant. Okay, how about this guy? Well, I know what it is. I'm not sure whether it's edible. It's a wild cucumber. It's a wild cucumber. It is a wild cucumber. Mm. Do you eat it or do you leave it? I'll say leave it. Okay. Is wild cucumber technically a cucurbit? Um, no. Or does that, <laughs> is that a sidebar cheat to the answer to the question? No, I don't think it's technically in the cucurbit or cucurbitaceae family. Um, it's viney, and if you ever see these, they are, again, really beautiful, but they can be very aggressive. Um, if you've ever cut one open, it's hollow. They're, it's like It kind of looks like a sponge gourd on the inside. Two really big seeds. Um, wild cucumber is not edible. It is really cool when it dries out. You can add it into like wreath um, arrangements, but a wild cucumber is not something that's recommended to harvest to eat. How about this guy? Is that a chamomile? Wild chamomile, did you say? Chamomile of some yeah. kind. Yeah. It's a, yep, it's. It's, some people call it wild chamomile, so yes. Would you eat it or leave it, Sharon? I'd make a tea out of it, maybe. Drink it. Or die, one of the two. <laughs> Sharon's done some studying. Um, this is another it. one of my favorites. <laughs> this is called pineapple weed, commonly. Um, it grows at River Edge, it grows in many lawns, in lots of gravel areas. Um, mm -hmm. Again, can be found worldwide. It, you know this plant by, if you brush it, if you squeeze it, it smells like pineapple. It's a very sweet smell. This one you can eat. Um, you can actually harvest just those little yellow, yellowish green things on the top are actually the flowers. You can harvest those and um, I've heard of people folding them into like a chicken salad or a tuna salad for kind of an alternative of like a grape or something for that sweet burst. Um, but it is very popular to use it in a tea because it is also called wild chamomile. How about this guy? Eat it. Oh yeah, eat that. Get out of my way. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. This one's... This one you get a bellyache from because you just gorge yourself if you're like me. Um, these are like a wild bramble, wild blackberry, this is, or wild black raspberry. Um, the only thing you really want, what's that, Jim? I have to fight the birds for those. That's yes. Right. <laughs> or if you're in Northern Wisconsin, you fight the bears for those. That's right. Um, <laughs> and so, the mosquitoes. <laughs> and, yes, yeah. There, there was a summer where I um, came upon one of these and ended up, very hot summer, dumping my water bottle, my Nalgene water bottle, so I could fill it with these um, <laughs> blackberries. And um, I was not sorry about that choice. Um, 
these can, you know, they can be popped right in your mouth. And for these, I don't even, you know, I don't even rinse these, right? Um, but they can also be collected and, you know, have them on your River Edge pancake, or, you know, to a jam or a jelly, or um, find a recipe in the Drunken Botanist and make yourself a drink <laughs> early during the evening. Okay, how about this guy? Does anybody know it? I know it, but I would guess not. Okay. Pineapple. Wisconsin pineapple. It's not a Wisconsin pineapple. Sorry. This is called ground cone. I learned about this plant when I was working for the Forest Service in Alaska. And a um, family of, of Inuit native people were collecting it. I um, was out just like hiking and uh, roving the trails and I just asked like, can I ask what you're collecting? Like what, I didn't even notice these things. And they explained to me, the, this woman and her daughter explained to me that they collect them early on before they get brownish like you see towards the top. And it, they're, they can be eaten raw when it's really early like that, um, kind of like a raw potato is the way that they wow. described it. They, but they have also taken those plants and traditionally dried them and then ground them into a flour hmm. to make, you know, all sorts of bread-like bread -like things. So this one, I, I would personally classify as an expert level harvester or forager. Um, I have never collected these personally, um, but they are really cool to see. They're, it, it's very strange because they literally look like a pine cone growing out of the ground. There's nothing else really to them. Sure do. <clears throat> okay, how about this guy? Eat it. That's plantain. That's plantain, yep. Plantain. Right. And okay. this is an eater. You can eat this guy. Even though it is, the, if you've eaten it raw, which I've, I've incorporated it into a salad before, um, there are lots of things that I've mentioned, like throw it in a salad, throw it in a salad. I, I want to add like a little star on the side of, if you go out and collect everything that I've listed today to throw in a salad, and that is the only thing in your salad, you will likely have some digestive things going on. Okay, because your body is not used to it, right? Yeah, you know, when we're little, our parents or our caregivers slowly introduce new foods to us and they watch how our bodies react. We likely don't remember that type of thing, but it's the same thing with wild foods. If all of a sudden you go from zero to 100, your, your body is going to be telling you in some way, shape or form whether they like it or not, or whether it agrees or not. So in general, you don't need to be my plug is you don't need to be a purist, right? If I have a mixed green salad that I went and picked up from Aldi or Costco, and I have a great harvest of plantain and some wood violets in my backyard, I may incorporate that in to impress my friends or <laughs> to add more vitamins and nutrients to like, you know, your, your meal and live off of the land, of course. So um, plantain can be really tough. You want to get this early. This is a um, again, what might be considered a weed in a lot of places um, and can be mowed over and comes back, but as it comes back, it gets tougher. So earlier on is when you want to get this green. Can you eat those seeds? Oh. Um, I like the tall spike thing is like the flower. I think you can eat the seeds, but I've heard that the flower, the, the, the spike of the flower you generally want to avoid during the flowering life or part of the life cycle. Again, I've heard it can cause some like throat and lung things. Again, plants just trying to make it. Um, we've been through milkweed, eat it or leave it. We've decided that we can eat certain parts of it, right? Really young shoots, leaves, and seed pods and seed pods are edible. You want to put them in cold water first, then you want to boil them for about 10 minutes, and then you want to kind of simmer them or saute them up. They have a really delicate flavor. The, you know, th those are harmless. However, 
they're poisonous raw. So just, they're not a, like, pop it in your mouth as you hike. So the flowers are edible raw, but again, I wouldn't eat more than one just because you don't want to, you know, harm the plant. Uh, and the rest of the leaves from the plant um, can give you heart, um, uh, cardiac arrest. So do not eat the leaves. And anybody mm -hmm. that has a latex allergy should not be playing around with that plant at all. Yes. Thank you, Mary. It's kind of cool how plants can like either have us thrive or not right. be able to. <laughs> so. Great, great strategies for survival. Yeah. Um, okay, how about this guy? Does anybody know this? Is that a rose hip? That's a rose hip, yeah. Um, really, really high in vitamin C. One of the highest vitamin C plants you can find out there. Um, this is a, from a rugosa rose. You can find them, again, a lot on an edge, like edge species. Lots of people incorporate these into their um, landscapes. Um, great for bird habitat, small mammal habitat. Um, the hips themselves, which is actually what they call like the fruit, the fruiting body that you see there, they contain a lot of tiny seeds. And those tiny seeds have like lots of hairs on them, um, itchy hairs. Rose hips or rugosa rose, those seeds were long ago collected actually to make itching powder. <laughs> so, don't eat these raw, even though they look just like a berry. You're, you don't want to just bite into them as they are. You, I should say you can eat them raw, but cut them open and remove the seeds first so you don't get that itching powder effect in, in your um, esophagus way. Um, rose hip jelly is very popular, rose hip syrup. Um, I've seen rose, rose hips soaked in just like a water as a tea. The petals can be soaked and dried as a tea. They can be thrown in salads. All right, eat it or leave it. They can make a tea out of that. Right, yeah. for sure. Yes, this is um, our staghorn sumac. Mid to late summer is the best time to get these hairy berries. Again, they're kind of hairy. You can eat a few raw, but the hairiness can sometimes cause your throat to be scratchy has a um, acidic lemony flavor that actually washes away with the rain. So as soon as you see these like beautiful berry clusters, when they're bright and they're full like that, harvest them because that's when you're going to get the most flavor as you soak them. Like Jim mentioned, you can make sumac tea, which is very similar to kind of a lemonade tea. Um, this is related to cashews. So if you are a tree nut, or seed um, sensitive human, you're not going to want to interact with, with this plant. Interesting. Whoops. Oh, yeah. How about that one? Oh, that looks See a thumbs down. Yeah. Um, this is a thumbs down. This is a false morel. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister lives out in Seattle and took a picture of the, one of these about three weeks ago and identified it as scat. Um, it's not scat, it's a, a false morel. Um, they are darker, they have a more kind of like slimier brain look than a true morel, okay? So true morels, of course, are like the gold of the Midwest, right? Um, but false morels, you just want to be really careful because those are, are toxic. I'm sure you could think of plenty of others, and like I said, I re you know, we could be here for hours and hours. These are just a list of others that I threw in here. Um, the possibilities truly are endless. We are surrounded by, by free, nutritious food. There's no harm in incorporating it into, into your diet with caution and with um, more learning and knowledge. There are a couple recommended resources that I'm going to throw up here, which I've already shown a few books. Um, I've learned pretty much everything I know, like I said, from Sam Thayer. My first book um, from him, this is the first book he came out with, The Forager's Harvest, is, I'm going to show you the back side embarrassingly. This book has been in my backpack everywhere that I've gone for the last 15 years, and I need a new copy. We are currently out of this copy at River Edge, but we have several of his second book, 
nature's garden, in the nature store. We do carry the drunken botanist, if that's more up your alley. And we also carry this book, which I started looking at earlier um, this week in preparation, Backyard Foraging. This one is brought to us by Ellen Zakos. Um, this one is a great place to start because it features backyard plants and what, you know, what do you know better than your backyard and where do you have permission to collect better than your backyard? So get yourself a book, um, connect with, with people of different cultures who know plants, maybe has different names or have different uses, um, but can share those with you. And um, go out with friends if you can. So here's a couple other guides um, for you to consider. And with that, I will open us up for just a couple more questions before we cut everybody loose around 1130. Or sharing, if anybody has any knowledge, you can definitely share your experience, your taste buds, your resources as well. So, thank you, Cassie. Great program. If you want to stop sharing your screen and we'll get to see everybody and then they can answer their questions. And I think they're all unmuted at this point. There we are. Hello, everybody again. So, other questions for Cassie? I have just one comment. You have to be a little bit careful on some of the stuff if you have allergies. I know that uh, I have hay fever and I made a salad of uh, dandelion greens and did not have a good reaction. So be careful. That's all I can say. Yeah. I agree, John. Similar for me with chamomile. Anything in the chamomile family, I have hay fever and um, I drink chamomile tea and I am much worse off than I was before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not good. Yeah, I'd, I'd also, also, I'd okay. also caution on um, elderberry if you have pets because I think that can impact pets. Interesting. Uh, good advice. Most of us do have pets, so yeah. keep them out of the elderberry. The other thing I've heard too is that as you start doing this wild harvesting to just introduce one at a time to your diet, not to go out and harvest a whole lot of different greens and throw them all together in the salad. That way you won't know which one is affecting you adversely. If you only add dandelions, for instance, to your regular salad tonight, then if you have a bad reaction, you know it's the dandelions. If you throw it all together, you'll have no idea of what it is that, that's giving you the, the, um, the trouble. So um, try, try them all first and then, then um, get you know, creative in mixing them together. Other ideas? Again, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Well, real quick I comment. No question. Next spring, if somebody wants to harvest some uh, ferns, I have lots of them. Good to know. We're going to put you on our list along well, with Sharon. We'll have to limit to some of that one third rule, but yeah, right. I definitely have them. How about morels? Nobody wants to share that secret with anybody. <laughs> we'll all be in line if you if you let us come over. We'll stay socially distant from one another. <laughs> oh, I think we've run out of questions, but I do want to thank Cassie again for her program. It was excellent, and everybody's going to go out there and explore not only their backyard but their neighborhoods and their local parks. Um, to remind everybody about next week, um, do encourage you to come back because um, 